Hello, my name is S.P. Dorning, or Stephen Dorning. Uh, I am the creator of Dream Tank Productions, uh, and this is the first of a video series that I'm going to start, to, or a vlog, as they call it nowadays, to keep the people that are interested in my works informed of what's going on. It's uh, easier for me to make a video recording than it is for me to try and uh, make a blog, apparently, because I'm always on the go. But uh, today we wanted to talk about the origins of Allen Grid, which is my uh, steampunk world, where Sebastian Locke, my private, my human private investigator, lives. And when I, I say uh, steampunk world, we're going to go with. Uh, let me let me explain that. Think World War II, uh, Elves is the Nazis, is 1940, well, 38 to 43, somewhere around in there. Uh, Sebastian Locke lives in Hammertown, which is uh, a goodly ways from the front line. Uh, he don't expect to see a lot of fighting because the, the Dwarven nation is holding the Elven Empire off at that point they're, 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 the conflict is not real close to where he's at but we're not going to talk about um, Sebastian today as much as we're going to talk about what brought him to life uh, back in the early days of my writing career I think it was 2010 I think it was uh, I joined a group called Imagicopy and they were a group of authors that were dedicated to promoting each other, to helping each other with their stories and their, their character development and just all around advertising, whatever, you know. Help getting the word out about people that are, are quality stories that don't get much attention. Uh, so I met a young lady there named Erica Raymer. She edited this book, Clockwork Spells and Magical Bells. Very talented young lady. And uh, she's actually really, really helped me by motivating me in my uh, writing career. But at the time that all this went on, they, uh, Magica, Mag Magicopter had... Uh, put out a call for steampunk stories because they were looking for stories to make an anthology. This particular anthology, it was uh, might versus magic, uh, mechanical versus spells. Uh, think Dungeons and Dragons, but with uh, a twist. Uh, steampunk. That was their, their their twist, the steampunk. And I'd never heard of steampunk before. So uh, I was didn't think much about it. I, I, actually, I didn't even uh, answer the first time that they put anything out. But then later on, they told us that they were having issues with getting enough stories to make an uh, anthology out of it. And I got to thinking, I, there's a lot of people who had contributed to this. They, they still needed two or three more stories before they'd have enough. This is why they put out the second call. And uh, I thought, well, I don't want them to miss out on their chance of being published in, in an anthology. So if I can help, I will. So I, I started looking into what I could write or what I could do to uh, help them with their anthology. And I had to break it down from there because, like I said, I'd never heard of steampunk. And steampunk, well... What steampunk is, is think everything that we run on electricity in steampunk is run on steam. And it's usually set around a, a Victorian era style setup. Uh, think a lot of brass and wood and very elegant looking equipment and in, in, uh, uh, machines. That's steampunk to me. If you ask different people, different people will give you a different definition of steampunk. But in my opinion, steampunk is brass, wood, 
and anything that was run on electricity today would be run on steam during those times. I mean, there was still a little bit of electricity here because it was just a fad that hadn't really caught on in this particular setting. Uh, there was wind power and, and some electricity, but mostly it's steam. Everything is run on steam. And so I started studying on that particular point. And the main thing that they wanted was a conflict, something happening between the mechanical and the magical. They wanted the conflict between, that was their gimmick, their, their twist for their book. So I got to thinking. At the time, I was playing a lot of uh, Mech Warrior Online and mercenaries and stuff like that. You know, I'm just, I like the, the, the idea of Battletech. Battletech was a big thing. I, I'm not diehard fans, but I do like reading this stuff. And so I thought, what if those were steam-powered and you were, had them run by dwarves? But then I thought, nah, that's probably been done before. But not to the degree of where it's paired down to. It's not a mech. It's a suit of armor that's just enhancing the dwarves' own abilities and helping them to fight in these wars. Well, that would... That would work really good. I mean, the conflict, you know, the when you think conflict, you think war. So there's that's where I was. That's where my mind went anyway. And then from there, I thought, well, what if the the elves or the people using magic? I didn't have elves in mind at that particular point. But when I think magic, I think elves. And uh, what if they had their own suits that was powered by magic, whereas the dwarves were powered by steam? And those two. We're at war, okay? And that's where all this came from. That's where my original short story, which is entitled, uh, it's titled uh, Survival in Clockwork Spells and Magical Bells. And I'm going to read that for you today. Starts on page 175. Survival by S.P. Boyle. Let me take my glasses off. Kerlak winced as the pulse cannon from the elven rake armor blasted his left arm. His own suit was an antique by comparison. He could feel the water in the he could feel the water from the damaged limb leaking into his suit. That wasn't good. If water was leaking into his suit, it meant that one of the cooling lines had ruptured. That in turn meant it was about to get really hot in here. When war had erupted between Kerlak's people, the dwarves, and the elves, all of the dwarves had been sure of a quick victory. The stick-like elven people were fragile in body and relied on their magic to protect them. In the beginning, it had been bloody, and it had seemed like the steam-driven suits that were piloted by the stocky dwarves would indeed be, would indeed be the deciding factor. Magic was powerful, but it was limited by arcane runes and sigils, whereas the only thing limiting the dwarves was their own imagination. Kerlak cursed as another pulse blast passed by his helmet close enough to blister the skin of his face through the visor. This elf was good. The war had raged on, and eventually the march of dwarves was brought up short. The elves had developed a new weapon. Taking their cue from the dwarves, the elves had designed their own suits, only the elven suits were powered by magic instead of steam. Kerlak was unsure as to how that worked, but he did know it was very effective on the battlefield. When the rake suits had first appeared, the dwarves had thought they were demon spirits summoned by the elves to fight for them. It was Kerlak's own cousin that had managed to kill the first one. The body had been brought back to Hammervale to be studied, studied by the chief builders there. It hadn't taken them long to realize that the suit was powered by magic. Apparently, the elves had gems that could hold a magical charge. This was stored somewhere in the suit. The energy from the gem would then be transferred by means of sigils that were inscribed in this special bodysuit that the elves wore beneath their armor. The armor itself was inscribed with wardings and spell symbols that would remain inert until the pilot triggered them with energy from the gem. The dwarves were unsure as to exactly how this was accomplished. Another blast from the elf showered him with dirt and small rocks. 
The suit was getting hot now, and Kerlak was beginning to think he might be outmatched in this fact, fight. With a hoarse battle cry, Kerlak charged straight at the rake suit. He fired a percussion shot from each of, the, each of his gauntlets and released a jet of steam from the underside of the left one. As he did, a warning light flashed inside his helm as the heat inside the suit increased another notch. Kerlak knew he couldn't do that again. Might kill his opponent, but it would more than likely roast him too. The rake pilot dodged aside at the last possible second, holes sprouting in the elven armor from Kerlak's percussion shots. As Kerlak twisted around, he stumbled and fell heavily to the ground, flat on his back. Fear clawed its way to Kerlak's throat and perched there with the dryness that had been his companion for most of, his, most of this campaign. Every dwarf knew that the elves were devil spawns, working their magic and speaking with the dead. Every dwarf knew that it was better to die on the battlefield with honor than to be taken as a prisoner and then seduced by the corruption of the elves. Kerlak glanced at the boom switch built into his armor. That was a last resort. If he triggered it, it would blow the steam pack that powered his own armor, leaving a fair-sized crater where his, suit, where his suit had been, hopefully taking his enemy with it. He growled and attempted to swallow his fear, scrambling to get back up on his feet before the elf gained the upper hand. The piston that supplied extra power to his suit's right leg began to make a grinding noise, trying to seize up as he re regained his footing. As Kerlak whirled around, it almost caused him to collapse again. The rake suit lay face down in the dirt behind him, unmoving. Kerlak knew there were only two ways to disable an elven suit. You had to damage it beyond its ability to function or sever its power supply. The trick was finding the power supply. Each suit was hidden in a different area. Each suit was unique. Sneaky elves. Kerlak could tell the damage he had done to the rake suit was not enough to stop it from functioning. He had done enough to disable the pulse blaster. That was mounted in the gauntlets, though. The sigils of the magic inscribed on the gauntlet that glowed when powered by the magic gem were dark. His percussion shot had punched through the armor and into the fragile elven fr frame inside. Maybe the blood leaking from the holes had blocked the flow of magic. Kerlak was still wary as he reached down and turned the suit over. Suddenly, the rake suit exploded into motion as Kerlak flipped it over onto its back. The metal gauntleted fists of the elven pilot cannoned, cannoned into the side of Kerlak's helmet. Flash bulbs of pain exploded in his eyesight as he stumbled backward. Two more times, the sledgehammers rocked his helmet from side to side, each time of forcing him back several steps. Kerlak could feel the armor getting heavier as the hydraulics ruptured and the coolant pumps began to fail under the onslaught. Kerlak looked up at the rake suit as it hovered above him. Had he gotten taller? No, he had fallen onto his back. A chuckle bubbled up from his lips as he realized why the elf had began fighting hand to hand. All of its weapon systems had been knocked out. All it had left was its fists. The chuckle grew into a laugh. As the laughter echoed out of the helm, the rake stopped its advance, cocked its head sideways, confused. You're wondering what's so funny, elf. Kerlak said through the faceplate. The rake just stood staring, waiting. Well, since you asked so nicely, I'll tell you. Kerlak was pretty sure the elf couldn't really understand him. Most elves wouldn't stoop to learn dwarvish, and he wasn't speaking common. We two are out here fighting to kill each other, and we never even met each other before today. All we know is that what the leaders tell us, they say you're evil. I don't know, maybe they're off. The thing is, you won't stop trying to kill me. And that leaves me with only one option. You put up a got you put up a good fight, Elf, but I still have weapons. As he finished speaking, he brought one, up one gauntleted fist and aimed its percussion shot at the rake's helmet. The gauntlet clanged loudly as he triggered the weapon. There was an explosion as the chamber ignited and tried to fire. To Kerlac, it felt as if his forearm had been caught between the hammer and anvil in his uncle's metalworking shop. The weapon must have been damaged during the fight. Pain blinded him, and everything went dark. Warmth flooded through him as Kerlak swam back to consciousness. 
It was a good kind of warmth. It seemed to soothe the pain and ease the tension of muscles. As he opened his eyes, he gasped in horror. The elf was using magic on him. Kerlak scrambled away from the elf. The elf had stripped him out of his armor and had discarded the rake suit as well. They sat there, face to face, with nothing between them except the histories and traditions that had started the war to begin with. Just two soldiers from opposite sides. It was the first time Kerlak had seen a live elf face to face. You spoke good words, the elf said in broken, heavily accented dwarvish. We not angered at each other. Kerlak's mouth dropped open. This elf was speaking dwarvish. How? was all he could sputter to the elf. Scholar, not soldier, the elf said, motioning to himself. It was then that Kerlak noticed the magic gemstone lying beside the elf. It was cold and dark. The elf had used the last of it to, to heal him. Why? It made no sense. Because to stop war, we need more use. The elf, the elf coughed, and the white bandage covering his chest suddenly grew a bright red flower that spread at an alarming rate. Cripes, elf! Kerlak exclaimed, exclaimed, rushing back over to him. The elf sagged like a broken toy and leaned all of his slight weight upon Kerlak. It weighed no more than a dwarven child. Kerlak eased him back onto the ground. The elf's breathing had become ragged, and another of the red flowers had joined the first on the plain white bandage. It was dying. Why? Kerlak screamed at it. Why did you save me, you stupid elf? Why? There was no reply. The light had gone out of the elf's clear green eyes. A sob welled up from the depth of Kerlak's soul, a sob that he had not known was there and was unaware was coming. I don't understand you, stupid elf, he muttered over and over again as he rocked back and forth in the fading light. Kerlak didn't know why the elf had saved him, but he knew he, wouldn't, he would be unable to fight another one without figuring it out. He buried the elf under a plain mound of stones. He was unsure as to what the rites and burials called for, so he buried him in the tradition of the dwarves. He placed the rake's helmet on top to mark it. As he made his way out, of the, out into the darkness of the night, confusion rode him like a demon. As he left the side of the battle, he never once looked back, and he didn't take a single boat, a single bolt from his steam-powered armor. The end. And that's survival by S. P. Dorning in Clockwork Spells and Magical Bells, edited by the talented Miss Erica Raymer. Still available on Amazon, I think. I'll put the link in the description. But that was my first story, my first steampunk story. And after I wrote this story, it wouldn't lay down. Uh, it just kept expanding in my mind and growing bigger and bigger until eventually the war had raged on and between the dwarves and the elves for centuries until they had forgotten what started most of it, the original conflict anyway. Uh, most people knew that elves were after world domination. They believed that all other races were inferior, so they were going to take over. Because I'm better than you. I'm going to run this. I'm going to run this town. And there's not room enough for another sheriff. You're just going to have to live with it. And as I did that, and the story kept raging on in my mind, I started watching a lot of uh, programs about uh, World War II and what was going on during the time that we were fighting against uh, Hitler and how he perceived it, because that was my elves. That's the way the elves were going to be in my story. And they were vicious and, and 
the dwarves were fighting for the good side. The, 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 they were the heroes. But at the same time, I got to thinking, the more I thought about it, and, you know, the resources were running uh, thin everywhere because they had sent everything to help reinforce the war effort to try and win the war. And uh, that's where I came up with Hammertown. Hammertown is just a little town, middle of nowhere, and they had sent most of their resources on to help the war until the town was dying. You know, uh, well, everything's dying at this point because the war is drawn out for so long. And uh, that's where I came up with Sebastian Locke. This is 19, I think 1930s to 40s, somewhere around in there, except everything that's powered by electricity is powered by steam, and the elves are the Nazis. You know, humans don't live on mainland. They live in uh, tribes, nomadic tribes on the waters, most of them do. Sebastian Locke is the exception, and that's where we're at. I hope you will consider sponsoring me uh, on Patreon. At the very least, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. There's a lot of free content there. I'll be putting stories out when I get time to make videos. I will put stories out there. And uh, I hope you enjoy them. That's my whole purpose in writing these and putting them out there is for your enjoyment. I'm S.P. Dorning.